Aubrey Sacco, an accomplished athlete, scholar, musician, and artist, mysteriously disappeared. Aubrey, who was then 23, was nearing the end of a five-month journey of self-discovery through India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. She graduated from the University of Colorado in 2009 with a double major in art and psychology, and she taught yoga, studied meditation, and volunteered to teach children in one of the region's poor schools on this trip. Aubrey, who had been everywhere from Costa Rica to Greece to Thailand, took a 45-hour train ride to Kathmandu, Nepal, followed by a 10-hour bus trip to Sayarubesi to get to the western tip of Nepal's Langtang National Park. But she may have made a big, perhaps even fatal, mistake when she left her laptop and other items at a hotel and headed out on the popular Langtang Trek trail alone. It was the end of the trekking season and very few other backpackers were in that area. And this was in April 2010. Ever since, Morgan, who's 21, is also an honor student and star midfielder on San Diego State University soccer team, and the rest of the Sacco family have been on an impassioned, arduous, and some might say unrealistic quest to find Aubrey. The family has spent tens of thousands of dollars in its unending search, doing everything from hiring ex-FBI agents to working with local Tibetans to traveling overseas themselves to look for her. And when Aubrey first went missing, her father, who just had hip surgery like two weeks before, she was considered lost. He got on a plane and he went to Nepal and he himself with his son Morgan literally searched for weeks with his hip barely being able to move he crossed through these paths and valleys and everything you could imagine he did this all to find his little girl and Morgan insists that finding his sister is not an impossible dream Morgan said I know it doesn't look good it's been nearly a year and a half, but I truly, truly believe she's alive. And the last contact that he had with his sister was April 19th, 2010, which was an email exchange in which they discussed taking a bike trip together over the summer. And he said, I just feel her presence. We're very, very close, very connected. And then we have the father, Paul Sacco, who also said, I just don't have the dread that a father would feel if his daughter was dead. I know in my heart she is still alive, somewhere. It's ethereal and psychic. It's beyond wishful thinking. And Morgan, his parents, Paul and Connie, and his older brother Crofton have literally done everything possible to solve this painful mystery. But sometimes doing stories on it like this can draw more attention to it, especially when this channel becomes bigger, that maybe the right person in the right country will see this and be able to alert authorities and somehow find Aubrey. And when it comes to the Sacco's family, they have put up websites and billboards. They've contacted politicians, the FBI, and the State Department. They've alerted the media, spoken to police and other government officials in Nepal, posted videos on YouTube, created a Facebook page, and even visited Nepal twice. Now, Morgan is an eternal optimist, just like everybody else in this family. And he said that so far, there is no evidence that Aubrey has died, and there could be any number of explanations for her disappearance. Now, this is where we kind of go into the weeds, because when Aubrey was in Nepal and going on her trek, many theories arose on how she could have just disappeared. And we're going to cover some of them. But while reading this story, there was simply just too much uh, to write and record so I'll just try to add a little bit more when I see fit and there was a whole other arc of this story that just told about 
Aubrey herself, how the many journeys she went on, and basically how right before this trek, she met this one gentleman in a cafe, and I guess they kind of hit it off, and this was literally the day before she was going out to the trek. So a lot of people think that he might be involved. Now, I don't want to say any names unless I have to, because I don't want to put blame on somebody that could be totally innocent. But in another picture, which we'll talk about in a minute, there was also someone else who might be involved. Plus, it's known that the Napoleons, I think that's how you say it, are obsessed with Americans. And sometimes the people down there live in different tribes, and some of them are even considered witches. And it's believed that maybe if one of them grabbed her it could have been for a ritualistic killing but i really hope that's not the case a lot of other peop people think that the men who there only would have been a few out there but that lived out there might have seen her and just taken her or maybe she got injured and that injury somehow fatally led to her demise or there's always the animal theory, like always, when you're out in the woods, an animal got a hold of her, and sadly, that could be how she passed. You see, Nepal has a reputation for being a very spiritual place, populated by gentle people, guided by beliefs in goodness and karma. People trekking there have even been known to want to stay there, but that really doesn't fit Aubrey's profile at all, e even though anything is possible. So now we're going to talk about more scenarios. Other possible scenarios are more horrific. It is a region of the world where young women are sometimes kidnapped and forced into sexual slavery. A thought that sickens the Sako family. But this does seem very unlikely because of the rugged terrain and because there probably would have been witnesses to her abduction. Now, when I read stories, I kind of get vibes sometimes. And, you know, with this one, as I was reading it, and believe me, I read it three different times and I wrote three different stories for you and I kind of meshed them all in one. But with this vibe that I got, I, for some reason, truly believe that Aubrey is alive. But another possibility is that the Napoleons or the Nepalese, I'm not sure which one to say, army had something to do with Aubrey's disappearance. Because Morgan said that it's a corrupt country with a very corrupt army and it's widely known that members of the army harass and even assault the female hikers on that particular trail. Now during their last trip to Nepal, family members met with the second in command of Nepal's army, General Gaurav Rana who promised to conduct an internal investigation and do a wide search of the area. And the family is waiting for the results of this investigation still. Now, the Sakos have hired dozens of people in Nepal to search for Aubrey, comb the grounds, search the trails, and the river that runs along it. They've checked nearby villages and talked to the locals. They are even working with the Maoists, a far-left political party considered to be terrorist by the U.S. government. And they're doing this to search for Aubrey because of the access that that party has. But the family has not hired an American private investigation firm. Many have come forward offering their services, but they have given the family some preposterous descriptions of how they would find Aubrey, including taking ATVs up the trail where she was last known to have been, things that her father has done many times over. And her father didn't use ATVs. He literally walked the whole way with a bad hip. So, you know, when someone offers their services to something that you've already done yourself in a personal matter such as this, it seems like, well, that won't really help. Plus, Connie, the mother, said you can never even get an ATV in that terrain. These investigators just want to grab our money. They have no idea how to even get to this remote area, let alone what to do once they're there. She also said that we learned quickly that, sadly, that this 
isn't going to help us. Even if we had the money that they were trying to charge us, we've learned that in Nepal, if you send Americans in, they don't get anywhere. The locals' mental doors close up. We've used Nepalis 95% of the time. Now, curiously, residents of the area where Aubrey disappeared are conspicuously quiet now when asked by the family if they know anything at all. Some have even changed their stories from the original ones they gave. So it might seem that they have been silenced by somebody or paid off by someone else. And if that's true, that would mean at one point they knew where Aubrey was and something sinister definitely happened. Morgan also said that when we first talked to them, some seemed to remember seeing Aubrey on the trail. But now, when we ask them for any information, they say, uh, they don't remember. It's like someone has gotten to them, and I think they know something. In this instance, I couldn't agree more with Morgan. Now, Morgan believes that the most likely scenario is that Aubrey was injured, and someone helped her get off the trail, brought her to a remote village, and then either she was held against her will, or she got lost trying to find her way back. Me personally, I would say that's a pretty likely scenario. Out of the hundred scenarios that are offered on this case, I would say that's definitely top five or top three. And Paul said, the father, that taking Aubrey could have been some sort of spiritual thing. Some village may have needed to be revitalized with an American like Aubrey, who had such energy and vitality. Our Nepali guide told me that Nepali people who are among the poorest in the world and have absolutely nothing are fascinated with Americans, and that Aubrey could be valuable to them, almost godlike. And he said, I know how that sounds, and it sounds far-fetched, but we aren't dismissing anything. Now, like I said, there aren't many clues. But there is that picture of an unidentified man in Aubrey's camera, taken shortly before her disappearance. Now this could provide some answers if her family ever discovers who he is. And there is a woman, Danielle Fouch, a French citizen in her early 60s, who trekked the Langtag Trail in Nepal at the exact same time as Aubrey. And it's very possible that Danielle saw Aubrey on the trail, Connie said. Uh, she also said, we contacted the French government to ask if they could locate her for us, but got absolutely no cooperation from them. And it's been one of the many frustrations in our search, Connie said. But the family's biggest frustration isn't with the French or Nepali governments. It's with the U.S. government. Although Aubrey's family and friends have sent more than 8,000 letters to, at that time, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton urging her to get involved in the search for Aubrey, Clinton has to date not made a public comment once about the case. Now, Paul said for the U.S. government, not to put people on the ground in Nepal to look for Aubrey, a missing American citizen, is unforgivable. And I truly feel for Paul. I mean, if I had a daughter that was missing in a foreign country, I would expect my country to step up and to try at least to help find her. So Paul would go on to say, what is up with this country? Our senators and congress members in Colorado have busted their butts to get through to Hillary, but have gotten nowhere. It's a complete joke. So as you can imagine, the Sacco family, especially Paul, was very upset with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And Andy Lane, who is a spokesman for the State Department, told ESPN, we have great sympathy for the Sacco family. The U.S. Embassy in Kathmandu is in close contact with the Nepali government, and they are continuing to work very closely on this. When asked what working closely means, or 
if Secretary Clinton is aware of the 8,261 letters sent to her office asking her to get involved in Aubrey's case, Lane declined to comment. So you got to understand that, um, especially if you've ever seen the show Madam Secretary, really good show, um, you would understand this, but the Secretary of State would be the person who deals with situations like this because the Secretary of State deals with other state provinces, countries, and they're usually the first one when an international incident occurs to get on the phone with a counterpart from that country and make amends or fight something out or debate or do whatever they have to do to fix or mend a situation. Now, everyone in the Sacco family has a different way of coping with Aubrey's absence. For Morgan, it's delving into his soccer and his studies. For the father, Paul, it's music. In addition to being a lawyer, Paul is a singer and songwriter who used to sing and write songs with Aubrey and has written numerous songs about her since she sadly went missing. And music is a big part of Aubrey's life as well. She started playing the violin as a little girl and was in the college orchestra and taught herself guitar, which I could never do. Connie says Aubrey was named after the bittersweet 1970s bread hit Aubrey, whose lyrics have proved almost eerily prophetic. Then Connie said, I've only recently had the courage to even listen to that song. It's so beautiful but it's hard to hear now. Paul's songs about Aubrey are the same. They're beautiful, but so sad. Now, the older brother Crofton, who was 26 at that time, managed to finish law school over the past year, and remember, we're talking as if we're in 2013, um, despite his sister's disappearance, and he wanted to make a big statement about the little sister he loved so much on a huge rock that sits in the middle of a field alongside State Highway 257 north of Fort Collins, Colorado. Now this rock sits on private property behind a fence and is a popular yet illegal spot for the community to paint and draw statements about college sporting events and other things going on in the area. So last year, remember we're talking as if we're in 2013, so that would be in 2012, the Sacco family and two friends went on a late night drive to that rock. They climbed the fence and were about to paint and douse it with glitter in loving tribute to Aubrey when the police showed up. And with the red police lights flashing, the group fled like fugitives into the night, but came back an hour and a half later to paint and cover the rock with glitter as planned. The entire episode was captured on video and posted on YouTube. And if I can find it, I will put it in the description below. Crofton at that time said he didn't care about the police and that he was beyond determined to do this for Aubrey. And ever since that night, we've called it Glitter Rock. Meanwhile, each family member continues the search for Aubrey and clings to the hope this long nightmare will end happily and their Glitter Girl will come home. And Paul the father said, we are all realistic, but we just feel it inside, all of us, that she's still alive. From a young age, Aubrey was destined for greatness and we feel like the world needs her. And he went on to say that she has boundless energy, a great intellect, goodness, driving ambition, and she really does brighten every room that she enters. Aubrey makes sad people happy. She never has a bad thing to say about anybody, and she's the most amazing artist I've ever seen. Paul continues, She's traveled the world and is only 24. If there were only one word to describe her, it would be inspirational. Everyone who knows her would tell you that. We will find her. We will never give up. And that's the somewhat end to a beautiful, sad, and tragic story that I hope comes out 
to a happy ending. But I must note that when I was reading all this information about Aubrey Sacos and her disappearance, like I said, I could have made this episode an hour long. Um, there was another part of the reading that I just wanted to add in because how I said that I got a vibe that she was still alive. Well, it turns out I'm not the only one. So listen to this. Now, later on, it is to be noted when Paul was later moving his mother into a nursing home in Chicago, someone said, this is the manager of the nursing home. And he was a high-powered businessman and very savvy. And speaking now as if I'm Paul, halfway through the tour, he notices the wristband that I wear for Aubrey. And he points to it and says, what's that? And I struggle with this. I don't want to get into it, but I respect Aubrey. So reluctantly, Paul tells the abbreviated version of how his daughter evaporated in a beautiful valley beneath the tallest mountains on earth. And at this point, the guy starts shaking uncontrollably, like he's about to go into a trance. And Paul asks him if he's all right. And he says, yes, but I am an intuitive and he says every feeling he's ever had, he's been right about. And then he says, right to Paul, looks him in the eye, your daughter, Aubrey, is still alive. 